Would you pray that today we Christians would be found faithful? Would you pray that today a story that you have heard hundreds if not thousands of times would not just be another thing that you hear, but that Christ on the cross might truly grip our hearts with the love of God and the hatred of men for what we stand for. Would you pray that if there's somebody in our fellowship today that is religious, but not a Christian, that today might be their day of salvation. Heavenly Father, in just a moment, we'll be opening our Bibles. And when we open our Bibles, God, I'm going to ask you to open our hearts and open our minds. To receive what you have to say today. Now, Father, we live in a nation that has redefined marriage. We live in a nation in which we see such hostility towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in a nation that doesn't want to hear right from wrong. And yet, Father, you have taught us that your word is true. And Father, you've invited us to come to you, sinners all, to find grace. And Father, today, when we visit the Lord Jesus Christ at a place called Calvary, I pray, dear God, that this will not be just an intellectual exercise not just be a check mark. yes, we went to church, yes, we heard a sermon. But Father, you will grip us with the love of God who would send his son to die on the cross for our sins. But not just the love of God, the hatred, the hatred of those without the body of Christ who hate being called sinners. Oh God, what a day this is to live. What an opportunity it is to shine for Jesus. I pray, God, that you will find us as faithful as Jesus who went to the cross. Now, Father, we're about to open our Bibles. And as we open our Bibles, I pray that you'll open our hearts and open our minds and teach us your truth. That is our prayer this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, okay, we're going to continue our series this morning. Our series is Walking in Wisdom. And today we're going to look at The Day God Died, Part 2. Today we're going to look at 9 a.m. and noon on the day that Jesus was crucified. And our text is Mark chapter 15, verses 21 to 32. And if you and I are going to walk in wisdom, then we know we have to walk according to the light of God's Word. And so let's say together, Psalms 119, verses 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Let's say it one more time. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Now today, just like last week and next week, and on Good Friday, we are going to be focusing our attention on the cross. Jesus on the cross. And I'm going to encourage you to be here Good Friday, March 25th at 6 o'clock as we meet here with candlelight and observe the Lord's Supper. It will be the day in which Jesus died and we will gather together with our bread and our juice by candlelight remembering what Jesus did for us. Before we do that, however, I want to remind you of the context in which we find ourselves. It was on Thursday evening that Jesus and the disciples met for the Last Supper. And sometime Thursday evening after sunset, it would have been after 6 o'clock, 
They gathered together in that upper room, and there they observed the Last Supper, sang some songs, and then they walked out. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. And then Jesus was arrested. And after his arrest, he was put on trial by the religious leaders. Religion put God on trial. First he was taken to Annas, the former high priest. Then to Caiaphas, the current high priest. And then he was taken to the entire Sanhedrin. The entire religious body of religious elite found God guilty of blasphemy and worthy of death. But the Jews couldn't enforce capital punishment. And so about 6 a.m., Jesus is taken to Pilate. 6 a.m., he's taken before Pilate. And the civil leaders, the Roman leaders, put God on trial. First Pontius Pilate, then to Herod Antipas, and then back to Pontius Pilate. And the Bible tells us in Mark 15:15. 15, 15, Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. So what Pilate did, he found guilty Jesus of treason. So they took the shirt off of the back of Jesus, and two Roman soldiers began to beat him with a whip. At the end of the whip were pieces of metal and bone embedded in the leather so it can tear into the flesh. There is no limit to the number of stripes a Roman soldier can give somebody condemned to death. And so many, many times this condemned prisoner actually died before the cross. After Jesus had been flogged, the Bible says in verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the place that is the Praetorium, the governor's official residence, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff. Again and again they spit on him, falling on their knees. They paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put on his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. So after Jesus is flogged, they take a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Then they take a reed and they hit him over and over and over. And so the thorns would just get embedded into his skull. And as they're beating his skull, they're... <coughs> spitting on him over and over. And in a mock way of homage, they kneel before him, Hail, King of the Jews! <clears throat> Spit on him and hit the crown of thorns and embed the thorns in his head. At that point, they lead Jesus out to be crucified after all of that. So that's where we'll pick up our story this morning. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. A man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. They forced him to carry the cross. So Simon, from North Africa, Libya, probably in for the festival of Passover, couldn't find any place to stay inside Jerusalem, so he lived out in the country. And as he's walking into Jerusalem to observe the festival, Jesus is being taken out by the Roman soldier. And Simon will be compelled, pressed into service, to carry the cross beam. Now the cross beam will weigh about 100 pounds, and after all of that Jesus has gone through, he collapses under the weight of the hundred pounds. And so Simon, you, you, you'll carry the cross. Mark 15, 22 says they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha. Now Golgotha is Hebrew or Aramaic for skull. It simply means skull. 
So they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, or skull. Then you notice the parentheses, which means the place of the skull. Now you see that word skull in verse 22. It's the Greek noun cranion. Cranion, from which we get cranium. In Latin, when they translated the Bible from Greek to Latin, the Latin for skull is not cranium, but calva, from which we get calvaria. And so in your Bibles, you'll only find in the King James Version one place the word calvary. But if you were reading the Latin Vulgate today, you would find calvary four times. And so where we get the word Calvary is from this word skull. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, Hebrew or Aramaic for skull, which means the place of the skull. In Greek, cranion, from which we get cranium, but in Latin, calva, from which we get calvaria. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. So let's look at this passage of Scripture for a moment. The Bible says they brought Jesus to Golgotha, to Calvary. We don't know exactly where Calvary was. There are various locations if you go to Jerusalem. But what we do know from the Bible in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, is this. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So we know that Calvary is outside of the city. And according to John chapter 19, verse 20, we know that it's near the city. Many of the Jews read the sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. So while we're not exactly sure of where Golgotha or Calvary is, we know it's outside the city, but we also know that it's near the city. The Bible says they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Proverbs 31, 7 tells us, Give wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Now Matthew chapter 27 tells us that Jesus tasted the drink, but then didn't drink it anymore. Now here's the fact of the matter. Women in Jerusalem were given the task of a condemned man was to be able to drink wine mixed with myrrh. Now myrrh had in it an anesthetic quality to help drug the victim. And I've often wondered if when the wise men brought gold and frankincense and myrrh, myrrh was symbolic of what would happen to Jesus on the cross. So Jesus tasted this wine mixed with myrrh, this sedative. He wouldn't drink it. He would experience the full weight of sin without any sedative whatsoever. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Four simple words. Let's say it. And they crucified him. Say it with me. And they crucified him. Say it again. And they crucified him. What a simple declarative statement that is, isn't it? And they crucified him. Four words. Why does not Mark elaborate? Well, Mark doesn't elaborate, number one, because the Bible was written by the Holy Spirit. So he wrote only what the Holy Spirit told him to write. But Mark is also written to people in Rome. People in Rome knew what the crucifixion was. They knew the pain. They knew the exhaustion. They knew the cruelty of the cross. They knew the bugs. They knew the flies. They knew all of the pain and torment of taking your wrist and wrenching yourself up on what they called the cruel step just to be able to lift up your diaphragm so that you could breathe. They didn't need any elaboration. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Dividing up his clothes, that's exactly what Psalm twenty-two eighteen says. They divide my garments among them. 
and cast lots for my clothing. Four Roman soldiers would throw the dice to see who would get what of the clothing of Jesus. John chapter 19 tells us, When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by law who will get it. This happened that the scripture, Psalm 22, 18, might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So while Jesus is on the cross, now oftentimes we think of the cross being very, very high. Jesus would have only been about six feet off the ground. And while Jesus is six feet off the ground, they're down there throwing the dice for his garments. Now, Mark tells us something that nobody else tells us. Mark chapter 15, verse 25. It was the third hour when they crucified him. So it was nine o'clock in the morning when men decide to murder their maker. It's 9 a.m. Mark that in your Bible. It was the third hour, 9 a.m., when they crucified Jesus. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. They crucified him. Now, if you took your Bibles, and you don't need to do this, but if you did and you went to John chapter 20, here's what you would read. It was resurrection day and I wonder if Jesus will show up. Well there was this guy named Thomas and he doubted. You remember Thomas doubted? John chapter 20 verse 25. So the other's disciples told him Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nails in his hand and put my finger where the nails were. And put my hand into his side. I'll not believe it. John is the only one that tells us about the nails. And so they crucified Jesus and they used nails. See, what would happen is he would carry his crossbeam of a hundred pounds. And when they got to the place, Golgotha, Cranium, Calvary, the place of the skull, Jesus would be put on the ground and nailed in the wrist on the cross beam. They would hoist him up, and then they would nail his feet to the upright beam. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews, when Jesus was being led out of Jerusalem, there would have been a note around his neck, a placard. It would have said, The king of the Jews. And the Bible tells us, in John chapter 19, verse 20. And the sign was written in Aramaic, or Hebrew, for the people who lived in Jerusalem. It was written in Latin, for because Latin was the official language, if you will, of the day. And it was written in Greek, the common Koine language of the people. Pilate wanted everybody to know that this Jesus, was the king of the Jews. And so it was lit, written in Latin and Greek and Hebrew. And after Jesus would carry the cross out, the placard would be taken from his neck and it would be nailed to the upright post on the cross. The Bible says they crucified two robbers with him. Interesting word. One on his right and one on his left. Two robbers with him. And if you were to take your Bibles and go to John chapter 18, verse 40, you would read, They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in the rebellion. Barabbas was a robber. The exact same word for robber is used for Barabbas as for the other two. And so most people believe that that middle cross was meant for the other robber, Barabbas. 
Did you know, according to Isaiah 53, verse 12, that the Bible says that Jesus would bear the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors and was numbered with the transgressors? Did you know that prophecy said that when Jesus died, he would die with other transgressors or robbers? And so you've got the picture now. It's 9 a.m. Jesus has been nailed to the cross beam. Jesus is on the cross. Two robbers on either side. Before we close this morning, I want you to hear. I just want you to listen to what was said on the cross. Verse 29. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe those crucified with him also heap insults on him. So there are three groups of people talking when Jesus is on the cross. The first, in verse 29, are those who pass by. And the Bible says they heap insults on him. Did you know that the Greek word there is not insults, it's blaspheme? They blaspheme him. How does that work? How do they blaspheme Jesus? Well, if you took your Bibles and you went back to Mark chapter 14, verse 57, you would remember the trial of Jesus before the religious leaders. And the trial of Jesus before the religious leaders they called in these false witnesses. And according to Mark 14, 57, then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days we'll build another not made by man. Now, did Jesus ever say that? No. Jesus never said that. It was a lie then, and it was a lie now. But evidently, some of the people who had been at that trial before the religious leaders came to the crucifixion, and they were repeating the lie. Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. It's true, isn't it? They will just continue the lie. Truth doesn't matter. They will lie, they will lie, they will lie. But why the word blasphemy? Why not just revile? Why not reproach? Why blasphemy? Because what blasphemy is, is saying that God said something he didn't say. That's blasphemy. God said this when he really didn't say it. And woe to all of us in this current generation who say, you know, the Bible says so and so, but it doesn't. What about all of the people and all of the churches and all of the denominations in our nation saying that God doesn't say anything about homosexual marriage? Is that not saying something that God didn't say? Would that not be a blasphemy? Of course it would be. Blasphemy is saying something, attributing something to God that God didn't say. And that's what they were doing to Jesus. But they weren't the only ones. Verse 31. In the same way the chief priests, think of it, Caiaphas the chief priest, Annas the former high priest, think of it, they came to the cross. They walked outside of the city and they came to the cross. And the Bible says, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him. Do you know what the word mock is? 
It's the Greek word in hazel, in play. In play. They were playing with Jesus. Playing with Jesus. Taunting Jesus. Jesting. Now remember, the Bible says they said it to themselves. They didn't say it to Jesus, they said it to themselves. But Jesus is only six feet off the ground. Don't you think that as they stood there in all of their religious attire, talking amongst themselves, don't you think they heard them, Jesus heard them say, Oh, he saved others. He can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Have you ever had anybody mock you? Make fun of you? That's what they were doing. They were playing with Jesus. They're making fun of him. <laughs> See this Christ come down off the cross. Over and over and over. And then there's the third group. Those crucified with him heaped insults on him. King James Version uses the word revile. It simply means to taunt, to defame. All of this was told in Psalms 22, 7. All who see me will mock me and hurl insults, shaking their heads. Here is the Lord. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. He's on the cross, fighting for every breath. The passers-by are blaspheming him. Hey, he said he would destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it. He never said that. They were attributing to God what God had never said. That is called blasphemy. And by the way, would it have been hard to rebuild the temple in three days? I mean, my goodness. He created the earth in six days. I think he could handle a temple in three days. It was just over and over and over. Then you had the chief priest, Impazio, playing with him. I can just see them, can't you? The teachers of the law and the chief. Oh, this Christ, this King of Israel. Let them come down from the cross that we might see and believe. Oh, they're so righteous and holier than thou. Taunting, playing with him. And then you have the robbers reviling him as if Jesus deserved to be there with them when Barabbas didn't deserve to be there. How would you make a connection with this passage of Scripture? Let me make a few. First of all, there's salvation. Look at verse 31 and 32. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Listen, if Jesus had come down from that cross, which he could have? We couldn't be saved. They said, let him come down from the cross. If Jesus came off of that cross, then none of us here could be Christian. We couldn't be saved. Ezekiel says the soul that sins must die. And in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 5, 21, we are told, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Somebody had to die for the sins. And either you die and I die, or Jesus died. And so while the religious leaders are saying, come down from the cross, had he come down from the cross, none of us could be saved. Somebody had to pay for our sin, and Jesus did. And then there's faith. Look at verse 32 again. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Is that faith? Is faith seeing, is believing? Faith is the exact opposite. Faith is believing is seeing. Faith is if I believe in God, if I trust God, I will see. They said, oh, 
Let us see you come down from the cross and then I'll believe. Really? Uh, walking on water wasn't enough? Raising Lazarus from the dead wasn't enough? Feeding 5,000 wasn't enough? Taking the demons out of the Gadarene the demoniac wasn't enough? None of that was enough? You need another miracle? Their problem wasn't a lack of faith. Their problem was a hard attitude. And that's why we sing at our prayer altar, change my heart, O oh God. It's a matter of the mind. It wasn't a matter of perception. It wasn't a matter of seeing another miracle. It was a matter of a heart, not accepting what they knew to be true. Jesus was appointed to die, Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of law, that he must be killed, and he must rise the third day. Jesus was appointed to death. And he was faithful to that appointment. So I'm asking you, are you faithful to that which God has appointed you? Ephesians 2, 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good work. Jesus was faithful. Are you faithful? He said, Pastor, I don't know what God wants me to do. Then you take that tear-off section of your bulletin. You fill it out. You put it in the offering plate. You say, Pastor, help me understand God's purpose for my life. I want to fulfill that for which God has appointed me. And finally, there's sovereignty. The Bible says that according to Psalms 22, at the cross, they will cast lots for the clothing they did. The Bible says in Psalms 22, at the cross, they will mock him and hurl insults at him. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, that at the cross, Jesus will be numbered with the transgressor. He won't be there alone. There will be others with him. Now here's the question to you. Isaiah 53 is written around 740 B.C. How in the world did God know that he would be numbered with the transgressor? 740 plus years before it happened. How does God know that? Or Psalms 22. Go home and read Psalms 22. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote Psalms 22. There was no such thing as crucifixion in Israel. Nothing like that. There wouldn't be crucifixion for centuries later. And yet David is describing to a T crucifixion. How does that happen? God is sovereign. God is omniscient. God knows what the future holds. And so I'm just asking you, and I'm asking myself, as you look out the doors of our church, as you turn on the news, and as you find more and more division and chaos and uncertainty in our world, who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? God does. Who has the plan for your life? God does. Wouldn't you and I be wise to trust in a sovereign God who knows the future over a thousand years before it happens? What are your choices this morning? Your choices are two. Number one, where will I spend my eternal days? Jesus did die on the cross for our sins. And 9 a.m. in the morning, he went to the cross. And he did so for you and for me. And you might be the most religious person in our church. But religion put God on trial. This isn't about religion, it's about Christ. It's about saying, I am a sinner, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's about realizing that the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's about understanding as many as received him, to them he gives the authority to become a child of God. It's about, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. It's about accepting Christ as your Savior. 
And if you are a Christian, how will you spend the rest of your earthly days? Jesus was appointed to death. And you have been appointed to a specific ministry. Will you fulfill that? How can you fulfill it if you don't know? How do I find out? When you take that tear off section. And you say, Pastor. When the Bible says in Romans 12, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Pastor, oh, Pastor, I want to give myself to God. I just don't know what he wants me to do. You fill out that little tear-off section and say, Pastor, help me to know what God wants me to do. Oh, and I'd be so delighted to do that. I want to remind you that we're going to have baptism Easter Sunday morning. What a great day to be baptized. If you've never been baptized, why don't you choose to be baptized this coming Easter Sunday? Take that tear-off section, fill it out, say, Pastor, contact me about baptism Easter Sunday morning. Father, thank you for Jesus. And thank you for the gift of eternal life. You know, God, the fact of the matter is we can sing about the cross and we can read about the cross and we can hear messages about the cross but the cross was real to Jesus. The nails were real. 9 a.m. was real. The thorns were real. It was all real to him. And it was real to him because he loved us. He loved us so much he died for us was the only hope of our salvation. And Lord, I, I think it's just really possible that there's somebody here who's not a Christian this morning. Boy, I think they're religious. They probably know more of the Bible than I do. They probably be more faithful to church than I have. But they've never admitted that they were a sinner and needed a Savior. And they've never opened their heart to me. That's why I would hope that today would be Lord, for the rest of us, I think many of us struggle with what it is you really want us to do. And Father, I would just hope, that based upon today's message, the faithfulness of Jesus in a place called Calvary, we might really take a hard look at our life and just say, am I really doing what God wants me to do? Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Father, you draw us to yourself, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let's stand.